you guys for uh, having to listen to me twice in a row this morning. Um, the song that we just sang, the little chorus, Paul is talking largely about evangelism and the need to um, give our lives in service in that way. It goes right along with our topic that we'll talk about and discuss in this hour. <coughs> Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is where we'll be at. This will just be a, a one-time study, not a series in any way. Uh, Brother Josh is out sick this morning, and so uh, this was a topic that I wanted to be able to talk about some to the church and cover anyway before the end of the year. And generally, uh, we, uh, we have a, a theme that we build to at the end of the year where we talk about commitments to giving to missions and, um, and how God would, uh, would lead us individually and our families in that way. And then, uh, and then, of course, that drives our missions budget very directly throughout the coming year. So that's what we're going to consider and talk about a little bit this morning. So we, we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to see some principles here in this passage of Scripture having to do with giving. Yeah. Spirit that God would desire to see in giving uh, to specific needs. So let's begin in verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul's writing, of course, to the church at Corinth, and he says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, or that means we want you to consider the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How then in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record... Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others. That would be the example of the churches of Macedonia he'd reference. By the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that is, there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to the man that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased, and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality, as it is written, he, hath, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Well, uh, I'd encourage you sometime to read on to the end of the chapter, not right now, so that you don't, uh, so that you don't um, fail to, to track with some of the thoughts that we're going to talk about. But the theme does continue, and we will bounce down to chapter nine in a little while, and we'll see a few more thoughts that uh, that continue in this line of thinking. Uh, well, we uh, we just recently endured a presidential election, or at least a part of one see where that goes. Uh, we saw polarity in our country probably more than ever before of those who consider themselves conservatives and those who consider themselves liberals. Um, there's a number of things that come to my mind and probably to yours as well when we talk about liberals. It often indicates in our country anyway party, a political party affiliation that would promote socialistic progress uh, or communistic ideals, at least that's where it drives towards. Being a liberal often speaks of being broad-minded, of being tolerant, of being loose in one's beliefs. It has come to indicate loosened moral restraints. And so uh, our initial reaction to hearing about liberals 
frequently is not a very good one. Those are the things that tend to come to my mind when I hear the word liberal or the description of a liberal. Um, my challenge to you today is going to be to be a liberal, all right, and don't have a knee-jerk reaction to that because the Bible's definition of being liberal has absolutely nothing to do with those things. In fact, if we're using the Bible's teachings, it speaks very strongly against a liberal socialistic government. The liberties that are enumerated in the Declaration of Independence and in our Constitution come straight from the Bible. That's where they have their roots at. The Bible teaches that there's only one truth, and we should stand by it and be willing to lay down our lives for it if necessary. The Bible doesn't teach us to be open-minded and tolerant of everything that we hear, as our typical liberal ideals would say. And further, of course, the Bible teaches very plainly the need for moral restraint. And so the biblical definition is a far cry from, uh, from the world's definition today. The Bible definition of the word liberal or liberality, and we see both of those words in our text, is simply to be generous to be sincere, to be single-minded in one's focus. To be, to be liberal in this sense is a good thing. And I hope that you picked up on that as we read through our text. To be liberal in any other way is generally not a good thing. To our point today, we see a wonderful example of liberality or of generosity in the example that Paul uses of the churches of Macedonia. Uh, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth which is in a, a different region of the country than, the, than Macedonia, a different part of Greece. Um, but the churches in that area are characterized in a very, very good way. And there's a couple of truths that I want to consider today about the quality of liberality that God wants us to have. Now, of course, we're not just going to jump right to talking about money and how much offerings we're going to get for missions because there's some very important principles that have to be laid down first and understood if we're really going to function in a way that's pleasing to God. I want you to consider that, first of all, liberality, as we see it defined here in the scriptures, is a work of God's grace. You notice at the outset of this text that grace is the operative principle in this chapter. Paul begins in verse 1 by stating, We do you to wit, or we want to bring to your memory or your consideration of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Well, what is grace? We're going to talk about grace a little bit in this hour this morning. We're going to talk about grace a little bit more in our next study this morning. But grace is the receiving of those blessings and riches from God that we do not and we never will deserve. God calls us through the word here to take note of how God's grace in the lives of the Macedonian churches was readily visible to the world around them, particularly to the churches around them. You know, we usually think of grace in terms of God's grace to us, and that's very appropriate as we define it from the scripture. God uh, is certainly the source of all grace. But in this chapter, we're also appointed to see the results of God's grace to us. It is seen in our grace to others, our willingness to channel the blessings that God bestows on us on to others that are also desperately needy. And Paul's going to use the churches of Macedonia as an object lesson of the grace of God in action. And that's really the, the theme of our study this morning is um, grace in action. These churches had received the gospel message. They'd heard the message of the cross, the message that told them how God had come in the form of Jesus Christ, leaving the splendor of heaven, leaving uh, his glory, and dying upon a cross for their sins. They'd heard that message. They'd heard it frequently. They'd heard it abundantly. They'd heard how Jesus Christ had been buried, how he'd been raised from the dead, defeating death and securing salvation for anyone who would come to him by faith and repentance. These churches in Macedonia heard that message, and folks, they took it to heart. It actually changed their lives in some very radical ways as they received the free gift of God. They became partakers of the grace of God, 
now they had the opportunity, along with the Corinthians, to extend that same grace to others in a very practical way. Uh, this passage is specifically directed towards those who have already received the grace of God. Because of what you have received, now you're called upon to extend that grace to others in God's service. The evidence of God's grace upon those people very clearly manifested itself in overflowing joy and rich generosity towards God's work. Uh, particularly we understand here, we should understand that the context has to do with monetary giving that's driven by some of these other principles. There were some dire needs in the case of, uh, of churches in, uh, in Judea. Um, they were suffering tremendously. And this was an opportunity for God's people to reach out and supply very important needs in God's work. Now, we're going to apply these principles more towards the giving towards missions, but these principles apply very much when it comes to supplying the needs of believers in Jesus Christ within God's work. Being liberal is a work of God's grace. It's not natural for man to be liberal in giving. And by nature, if we're honest, at least I'll be honest with you today and say that by nature, I'm a very selfish being. We want what we can get for ourselves. We stockpile and we hoard and we accumulate everything that we can. And for what? There are a number of folks who did this and, are, and, and their accounts are recorded in the Bible for us. Uh, God very directly calls them fools. So liberality is against our fleshly nature. But what we see is that it is a work of God. It's not a work of man. And so we don't depend on our own nature in this context to drive liberality, we look at the grace of God that's been bestowed on us, and then we respond in kind as that grace changes us. Something that we ought to nurture because of what Jesus Christ did for us. He gave us a new nature, didn't he? What I'm saying is that by God's grace, we can be generous, we can be liberal in our giving to the cause of missions particularly, or to any cause that God may lay upon our hearts as we follow the scriptures. So liberality, first of all, is a work of God's grace in the hearts of his people. Liberality is also a quality that God blesses, that he richly blesses. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 and 25 says this, There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meet or appropriate, but it tendeth to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Now, when we talk about this, I want to emphasize that I'm not talking about foolish or blind faith in just um, ridiculously and... Uh, and overabundantly just giving things away without being prudent. That's not faith at all. Um, God doesn't ask us to do foolish things under the guise of faith. In fact, monetary principles that are plainly laid out for us in Jesus' own teaching are, hey, if you're going to make it, you better count cost first. You better make sure that you can follow through what you commit to. And so God doesn't ask us to do foolish things under the guise of faith. Uh, we have learned under the, the uh, sound teaching of Paul through the book of Hebrews for the past year that faith is based on the sure promises of God and on the truth of his word alone. It's not based on some vague principles or emotional responses to things. God's promises can be trusted. He cannot lie. And so God promises throughout his word here, in Proverbs that we just saw in other locations, that he will bless liberality. We're talking about how liber liberality is a quality that God blesses, and thus it should be cultivated in every capacity that we can. Uh, consider um, back in 2 Corinthians here, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the very next chapter. And again, this is a continuation of the same thought about reaching out to and ministering to the needs of God's people or of his work. And so, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, Paul says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. 
Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. We're going to talk about some of those principles here in a minute. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. In other words, as a response of his grace coming to you and then you sharing his grace with others, God is able to make all grace continue to abound towards you then. That ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, and then notice this phrase, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So in other words, there is a very direct physical blessing that's given to those that are in need and their needs are supplied. And then there is an increase of your own righteousness before God as those needs are met. Uh, verse 11, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. Uh, we, could, we could read on, uh, maybe we'll read uh, about two more verses. For the administration of this service, that is the service of giving, not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration... They glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and to all men by their prayer for you, which long after you in the exceeding grace of God in you. And of course, he ends with thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift, which is what summarizes this, uh, this whole topic really well. Well, um, what we see here primarily that I want to point out as we consider the fact that liberality is a quality that God blesses. Liberality is a characteristic of righteousness, and we saw that statement made several times in the scripture that we just read. That's especially in verses 9 and 10 in that parenthetical, um, the righteousness that comes from giving remains forever. Uh, consider another verse, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. It says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. In other words, even as Jesus Christ is righteous. Um, righteousness, as defined here in these passages, uh, speaks of the righteous life which appropriately results from salvation, from the gospel. It's seen, uh, again, in 2 Corinthians 9.13, where it says that uh, as you perform or engage in this experiment of giving liberally, People glorify God as they look at your subjection to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what they see. That's what stands out to them as a clear testimony. Uh, it is the actions, this righteousness is spoken of, it's the actions and the lifestyle that should result from God's saving grace. And making us new creatures. Many people, of course, in the religious realm try to become righteous by doing righteously. We don't have to worry about that because we can't do that at all. Jesus Christ took care of all of that. He makes us righteous when we trust in his grace. But under God's grace, we do or should do righteously because we have been made righteous. In our context here, Liberality in regard to God's work is a characteristic of being saved. That's the point. Every year, of course, as I mentioned, we take up the challenge of giving to missions. As a church body, we make commitments to certain missionaries. As individuals, we make commitments in the context of our church body as far as what we're going to give so that we can understand uh, exactly what we're capable of giving Two missionaries. We're counting the cost. Uh, we call upon ourselves during this time of year very frequently to evaluate our stewardship of resources that God's entrusted to us. We individually bring before God the question of how he would have us prioritize and stretch the resources that he's given to us so that we might be a blessing to God's work and show this characteristic of righteousness that we're talking about. Psalm 112 tells us more about why God gives these riches or he gives provision to us. Listen to it. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, 
that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Uh, and so again, just the continuation of this same theme that, uh, that this is righteous acts that God expects to flow out of knowing him. <clears throat> Many of you, or at least, well, I should say some of you know uh, Brother Larry Adkison. He was, he's been up here a couple of different times. He actually passed away just, uh, just earlier this month or this past month. Um, but he was up here a number of years ago, and I actually uh, wrote down a quote that he gave, or it came personally from him during one of his messages, but this is what he said. It was really good, and it stuck with me through these years. He said, when God blesses us, it is not to increase our standard of living. It is designed to increase our standard of giving. And that's a very important reality that if we really understand principles of stewardship, that we ought to live by. And often, as we saw here recently in our James study, we're guilty of only wanting God to bless us so that we can consume it upon our own lusts, right? We have desires, we have things that we wish for or want, and any time we gain more uh, finances and more capability of meeting those desires, those personal desires, that's what we expend resources on. And the, the New Testament teaches us uh, the principle that giving is to be in accordance with our ability. In fact, we saw that very plainly here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It's a matter of common sense because you can't give what you don't have. But in the cases of, in the, cases of the Macedonian churches particularly, the Bible tells us that they gave beyond their ability. They, in fact, it says they impoverished themselves in order to give more than they were financially able, at least by the world standard. It's two times in, in verses 3 and 5, he talks about that. Uh, Paul had called them to give that which they were able. In fact, you might recognize some of the verbiage throughout that passage of Scripture. He said, this challenge was laid out to you a year ago. And you guys had a willingness of mind to take on the commitment to fulfill these particular obligations. Now, a year later, you need to be faithful to follow through with it and do it. That was the case in Corinth. The case of the Macedonians, they had fulfilled it. But, uh, but in the case of the Corinthians here, Paul had called on them to give that which they were able, just that which was appropriate, that which was a, a Christian duty. And by the way, the Bible very plainly calls for Christians to give in two areas. In fact, the first area I wouldn't even call giving because it's really an obligation or a debt that we owe. Um, we are called upon in Scripture very plainly to give tithes to support the work of the Lord in a local church ministry. We have that expectation from our members. It's very plainly laid out in Scripture. It's plainly laid out in our church bylaws and covenant. Um, we don't try to squeeze visitors for, uh, for any kind of giving or offerings or tithes. Uh, we don't go out into the community and try to support our church through any other types of fundraising efforts. It is through the giving of tithes. That's an obligation before God. Uh, it's appropriate. It's what's expected of God. Uh, but a second area that the Bible calls upon Christians to give, just as, uh, as Old Testament saints were called upon, was in, in addition to tithes to give to special needs, to give free will offerings, and in this case, particularly in the New Testament, for the cause of missions and for the, the needs, the legitimate needs of others of God's people. Our text calls on churches to perform this second duty. But the Macedonians were tremendous in their example in that they went far beyond that which was a mere duty. It was beyond what Paul expected. They went of their own accord. They gave sacrificially. They gave up some things so that they could bless God's work and God's people. They didn't do that because they were forced to. The giving was of their own accord. Verse 5 in our text is a key thought. This they did, not as we hoped. In other words, it wasn't just the level of expectation that we laid on them. Not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. And so a number of things that we can see about them as we consider that, uh, that, that, that uh, 
liberality is a quality that God blesses and it's expressed as righteousness in God's eyes throughout Scripture. But these were people in this Macedonian example, Macedonian example who were surrendered. You know, when an, when an army is conquered and they surrender, they are at the absolute mercy of the conquerors. They go where they're told. They follow orders because they have no choice. Generally, they don't want to surrender and submit. They do it because they're forced to. Well, our God doesn't deal in that way. He doesn't force surrender on anybody. He doesn't work by coercion. We understand from the scriptures, God isn't a tyrant. He always gives people a choice. In this case, what really made the Macedonians stand out and shine was that they didn't feel like their arms were twisted in some way by the Apostle Paul or even by God. These people gave their own selves to the Lord. The Lord had control absolutely of their hearts. God asks us to do this, and this example is even placed in Scripture uh, to mirror what God expects of the Corinthians and, uh, and similarly of others of God's churches who read this scripture. God asks us to do this because it's our reasonable service. He wants us to be surrendered. He wants us to submit. He doesn't force us to do his will. It's not, God doesn't operate like the debtor's prisons that they had in Bible times or in medieval times with people called tormentors who had their means of extracting what they wanted from folks and forcing submission on them. God gives a free choice. But I can say that there's nothing quite as satisfying, there's nothing quite as relieving, nothing quite as joyous as yielding to him. And I'm not just talking about in the area of finances, I'm talking about the, the true condition of our hearts. Yielding to him. Not just parts of our lives where we, while we hold other parts back, but surrendering all to him. That's what the Macedonian believers did. That's what's emphasized to us. And their faith in God and their rich service to him was spoken of throughout the whole world in that day. It's still spoken of today, obviously, because they're the theme of our study. They were able to affect the whole world for God, gave themselves to the Lord and and then God was able to use them. So the matter of surrender is where all the battle really lies. Now, by the way, if God is very directly calling you to some specific ministry, and we understand from the scriptures that he has a ministry for every single one of his people, you need to surrender and you need to get busy in it. If God is asking you to give up some things, you need to surrender. If God's dealing with you about salvation, you need to surrender. Particularly, to stay with our theme here, if God is challenging you in this area of giving to missions or of reevaluating some things, you need to surrender, and so do I. Our lives are to belong to God, and God can't do anything at all with an unsurrendered heart. These people gave themselves wholly to the Lord, and by the way, um, it, it's always a lot easier to give away someone else's belongings, isn't it? Uh, we definitely see that in the case of our government, our liberals that we're talking about in government structure. They're all too happy to give away other people's money, to give away other people's belongings. But when it's ours, we feel it when we give it. It costs us something. There's sacrifice that's involved, which makes it all the more meaningful. The Macedonians had given themselves to the Lord already, and so they weren't living frivolous, soft, self-pampering lives in any respect. Their hearts were already the Lord's, and so everything else followed, including their finances. As a result, it was a simple matter to take that which already belonged to the Lord and hand it over to his work. The problem that we often have is that we don't want to give things up because the Lord doesn't really have our hearts in every area. And so we have to ask this question this morning, um, does he have my heart? In every respect, am I really surrendered? And so, as we consider this uh, this righteousness um, that's found in giving, we see that these people were surrendered. We also see that they were committed to something. Paul calls on the Corinthians, "Hey, be uh, be faithful to follow through on your commitment. Show that you're really committed." The Macedonians had done that. Once they surrendered, 
They only had to find what God wanted them to do. And when the need was presented, it was a no-brainer. In this instance, he wanted them to give sacrificially to his work to meet some specific needs. Verse 5 tells us that they gave themselves not only to the Lord, but also to us. And so it was broader, actually, we see, than the giving to the churches in Judea. Uh, Paul wasn't of those churches, but he, speaking as one of the founding missionaries of that church, and as a continuing missionary in other communities, he said, look, they gave their hearts to the Lord, and they gave their hearts to us. That's what they were committed to. <coughs> there was total commitment there. They were willing to take this on. And again, I have to challenge myself and ask myself, what have I given myself to? What have you given yourself to? In their case, it was a commitment to give themselves wholly to God's ministry. Absolutely in every respect. Also, uh, they, they knew that what they were doing was the will of God. And that was what helped to drive this as well. They knew very specifically what they were supposed to be doing because they had been taught the scriptures. And they fully accepted the scriptures by faith. God had their hearts, as I mentioned, and they responded in a God-honoring way when the biblical need was laid out. They had hearts to follow God's will. Uh, and again, I don't have time to go back and read it, but all throughout our text in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, you're going to see that brought up time and again. Um, Paul's specific statement that I just referred to, that they gave themselves unto the Lord and they gave themselves to us by the will of God. That's what God's will is. I hear people talk a lot about seeking what God's will might be for their lives in some respect. And they speak about it in some kind of vague, ambiguous way, like somehow God's going to um, send a secret message to them in some fashion. No, God gives us his word. We place our confidence in his word and we follow it by faith. That's how we learn God's will. And so what is God's will for you and I in this matter of missions giving? It's not something that I can set a figure on if we speak in a very tangible way. But I do know that it is God's will. And that each of us must bring before God, as stewards of his assets, our hearts and whatever is placed into our care and seek God's direction in determining his will personally for each one of us. God wanted the Corinthian church. And he wants each of us to follow the pattern established by the Macedonians. There may have been more churches than the church at Thessalonica that's being referenced here, but, uh, but the Thessalonians are definitely spoken of in this regard. And if you read through those two epistles to the Thessalonians, you're going to see these very things referenced and praised by Paul. And this is where we really get to the heart of the matter. How can we really be liberal in regard to God's work? This is what Paul addresses back in our text in verses 6 through 9 as he challenges the Corinthians to follow this example. The Corinthian church, folks, was rich in many areas. Paul mentions that they possessed many of the spiritual gifts that he had addressed in and, in, in and through the letters to the Corinthians. They were rich in those ways. They were also rich financially. Paul now challenges them to abound in this grace also. You've been given a lot of gifts. Make sure you abound in this gift as well. Apparently, we could say the Corinthians were lacking, and that's why Paul had to drive this challenge to them. Paul makes a few points to the Corinthians that we need to look at before finishing up this morning. To give, particularly to give to missions and to show a heart for God's missionary work that he has tasked us with doing around the world. Sometimes it's done um, carrying out the Great Commission through our ourselves here in our local community, and sometimes it's done through funding and facilitating others that are dedicating themselves to go do this work. But there's some things that it shows or proves about us or about our hearts. And, uh, and by the way, I, I try to say this frequently and keep it before everybody's attention, um, but the, the heartthrob of our church Obviously, it must be Jesus Christ first and foremost, but it better be missions as well. That's the reason that we're here. If we lose that, or if we find ourselves starting to pull back or shrink back from our 
missions giving or from our dedication to supporting missionaries and loving missionaries to the world, we better reevaluate whether the Lord really still has our hearts because the chances are he doesn't. So to give particularly to missions manifests some things about us. Here's a couple of them as we just walk real, very, real quickly and in summary through um, this text. Number one, the evidence of God's grace on us should manifest itself in overflowing joy to do God's work and to rich generosity towards missions. Our hearts should be so thrilled about God's grace and what he's done for us that this should be counted as nothing in comparison. Nothing that we do can possibly repay what God's done for us, but we can be faithful to do what he asks. And so, the first thing that it proves or manifests about us is uh, that God's done a gracious work in our lives. A tremendously gracious work. In verse 8, secondly, we see that giving shows the sincerity of our love for the Lord. Paul says it very plainly there. They speak not by commandments. In other words, this isn't something that he's pulling from the Old Testament scriptures that's already been written down. It was new revelation from God for the New Testament time period. But I speak by occasion of the forwardness of others to prove the sincerity of your love. Number three, when we give sacrificially, it shows that we have a heart to follow the example of Jesus Christ. And we see that in verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, this is speaking of everything that you can possibly imagine, the spiritual and the eternal and physical riches, the power that he maintained in heaven. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor. He became destitute, that ye through his poverty might be rich. That's an example that we're called upon here to emulate, by the way. There is no expense that is too great to reach out and to minister to the soul of someone else and bring them to the grace of God. And so when we give sacrificially, it shows that we have a heart to follow the example of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Number four, when we give sacrificially, it shows where our hearts are really at. It displays our willingness of heart to be used in whatever capacity the Lord wants. And we see that in verse 12. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. How many times have you found yourself saying, I just don't have enough to do this? That's, that's what he's driving at here. He's saying that's not going to be what people dwell on, what they don't have. They're going to be looking at what they do have, what God has entrusted them with, whether in spiritual giftings, whether in tangible financial giftings, and they're going to give that. When we give sacrificially, it shows where our hearts are really at. Covetous, envious of others or of what we don't have, or productively looking at what God has entrusted to us as good stewards and designating it to him. And then number five, it also shows a, a willingness to get busy. In verses 10 and 11, he says, And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you. That means it is appropriate for you. This is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. In other words, once again, the commitment was made a year ago. Um, now you need to do it. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. That is, there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. And so Paul finally brings a call to action here after building all these principles this call is based on the principles given in verses 1 through 9. And the lesson here is that it does not do any good at all to hear teaching on a topic like this and just mentally agree. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, that's a tremendous need. Yeah, we need to send missionaries. Yeah, we need to make sure that they're funded. We must follow through on such a desire and then continue to put it into practice. We must step out in faithful obedience and be surrendered and committed to God's work. God doesn't call everybody to be a missionary. But he does call everyone to take part of this ministry of giving. 
Paul's heart was stirred by the sacrificial hearts of the people of Macedonia and what they were able to accomplish. And by the way, uh, if you read about the Thessalonians, you're going to see that they were a tremendously impoverished poor people. Paul's hope, as he was inspired by the people of Macedonia, was that the rich Corinthian church would have the same heart and be able to do just as much, if not more. So my challenge today is this. As I consider these principles from the scripture, once again, we're not talking about some blind leap of faith. We're not talking about some surreal, weird um, uh, lack of objectivity in what we're doing. We're talking about evaluating as biblical stewards what God's entrusted to us, evaluating the principles of God's word, evaluating the tangible needs of missionaries, and then acting upon that. So the challenge today is this, if the Macedonian churches were able to give so abundantly and be such a tremendous blessing in their deep poverty, as the Bible puts it, what can an American church do with the tremendous wealth that we enjoy? Are we ready to communicate or ready to distribute and willing to communicate, as the Bible puts it? How sincere is your love for the Lord? How committed are you to following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, who sacrificially gave everything he had? He impoverished himself to be able to communicate his grace to mankind. The Macedonian churches impoverished themselves for that which was truly important. How committed are we to following that example? How willing is your heart to be used in this area? And so our objective here will be within the next couple of weeks to lay the matter out wholly before the Lord in prayer. I call on each of you to do that as individuals and as families to consider what God would challenge you with in this coming year. And in a few weeks, our plan is to take up pledges from our families here in the church for our members in the church if there's individuals within families as the Lord would lead in that. So be prayerful and be considerate about that. And let's continue to foster a heart for missions. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the examples you give us in your word. I pray that you'll find us considering and challenged by and applying these principles that we've read today. Help us to truly evidence, I pray, the sincerity of our love for you, the sincerity of our commitment to your work. I pray that you'll find us completely surrendered, willing to, to display this attribute of tangible righteousness that the Bible talks about. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.